I'm Ashley Lichtenbarger and the camera woman is Megan Frick. Um, we're working for the Wabash County Historical Museum. John, what war did you serve in and what branch of the military were you? I was in the Korean War. I was in the Army. Okay. What was the highest rank that you achieved? I achieved a corporal. Okay. And from what years? From 50, November 1st, 15, 1950 to September 1952. Okay. Uh, were you drafted or did you enlist? Drafted. Drafted. Um, did, were you drafted before or after the breakout of the war? After the breakout. Okay. Um, where were you living at the time? Fort Wayne. What do you remember the first days of service? We were inducted in me and brought in the first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was <laughs> quite interesting. They'd come in here and told you to give you a uniform, what to wear, and then the next thing he did, he cut our hair, cut our hair down to to a. Uh, Butch care cut away, you know, short hair. Mm -hmm. Um always feeling clothes away from you, so you won't eat them anymore and give you your uniform, army uniform from head to toe. Did you, to. did you get your civilian clothes back after? Uh huh. Okay. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> I sent them home. I got them back with sent them home, guy, because you didn't take didn't need them in the army anymore because you couldn't you had to still your arm, wear your army uniform at all times. So. Right. Um tell me about your boot camp and training experiences. Well, boot camp was quite interesting. We learned the basics of how to handle a rifle, how to fire one, how to how to march in parade, how to march at, at, in, in attention like you're supposed to, and stay in step with the guy in front of you, know, and how to learn how to salute officers, military courtesy, and all that stuff, and also how, and how to walk and do the different different steps. You like about face when you stand here, turn around in a circle, and you're going out the direction. It's called an about face. Mm -hmm. And we learned uh, there again army army rules regulations. We learned about army food, which some of them was the best in the world, but it was good food. Mm -hmm. And uh, our, we had a good sergeant. Had a good sergeant. First sergeant, he was a real good guy. And our next guy down with the corporal, he was kind of rough, but he, the first sergeant was a good guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the camp regularly, we had really cold weather in, in the in the winter, and our captain made us go out and bivouac in twenty below zero weather. Intense. It was pretty cool. We kept mm -hmm. all our clothes on when we went to bed. Now we didn't take anything off. Mm -hmm. um. And then we like to learn how to handle a firearm, how to, how to handle a bayonet, a whole bit, everything. A machine gunner. How to learn, use a machine gun. How to handle a mortar. Safety and all that stuff. Right. Where were you placed in boot camp? Camp Breckenridge in, in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Camp Breckenridge. And then for further training? Went to Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas. This was an anti-aircraft school. Okay. Um, during the war, do you remember where exactly you were, mm -hmm. where you went? Well, then in Korea, they shipped us to the front lines, and we were near, we were in a village called Yongdong Po. Okay. Close, also close to another village called We Jungbu. We went, went from one to the other at the time. We moved from one place to the other, but we were there most all the time. Do you remember your arriving and what it was like for you? Yeah, very much so. We arrived at uh, Pusan and they put us on a train. And we got started to go up to the front and our train got held up by the enemy. And they called for help and they got an infantry squad to help us get out of there. Because they had us pinned down, we couldn't, couldn't go anywhere one way or the other. We were just stuck in that train. We didn't, call, they didn't have a rifle or anything yet until we got to our unit. So, but they finally got out of there and went on fire up to to the our uniform, which to our units, which was kind of a, <laughs> not a good way to start a war, but it was, but we came out of it all right, but nobody was hurt or killed, but we were stuck in it for quite a long one time, so we were gonna get out of there. <laughs> um, do you remember the people that you saw there, the yeah. Korean people? Yes, they were all pretty much poor. They had a completely type of dress and what we have, and the children were really in rags. They didn't see, didn't see any very well dressed. They were all very poor people. We, they would, uh, so we'd have hire one, hire a girl or boy, and they would wash our clothes for us in a stream. We couldn't do it with soap water, but we'd been in a river someplace. You had to count all your items before you gave them to them. If you didn't, they might come back, sh back short, a piece or two. Mm. Um, had you ever traveled outside of your home before this? Oh, uh, you mean know, in another country or just out of the state? Mm, either. They were out of the country before that, but out of the state, yeah. yeah. So was it a big experience 
being from Indiana, going to Korea. It was quite quite change, quite change. Their way of life. Well, they they were, their main stay, main food was rice. That was their main food. Mm -hmm. They had a, a natural dish, what they called kimchi, called K I M S H I. It consisted of rice, fish heads. Barley, and they put it in a big um, stone jar like that, and they buried it underground for two weeks and eat it after fermenting. Yeah. You can smell my mouth, they smell terrible. I said, How do you eat it? They said, Oh, good. I said, No, it don't smell good to me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, what was your specific job? I was in Corps headquarters. I worked the supply. Okay. Um. <clears throat> Did your unit see many any um, combat? No, we were no. We used that most time. We supplied the combat men for what they needed: for clothing, food, medicine, rifles, ammunition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were not actually in the fight itself. So. See, for every one hundred one, one man on the front line, there's hundred guys back in the back lines take help supply and take care of them. Mm -hmm. That's one of those one hundred. Do you feel? What were your feelings about being one of the ones in the back? Well, it's fine. I said he'd rather have been back there and being shot at. So, right. you know, it was all right. Okay. Um, Sounds of longevity are a lot better back there than being shot at. So. That's true. Um, tell me about a couple of your most memorable experiences. Over there, or in the army. Over there, yeah. Well, uh, the, w the winter would be terribly cold, and uh, they have issued us army mountain sleeping bags. And that was the thing that kept me from free death. It would be so cold. go from zero to 40 below overnight. And you didn't ever get used to that cold. And when we get inside the sleeping bag at night, you kept eating your, we took everything on but our, we left everything on but our boots and our shoes and then took them off. We got inside the thing and zipped up. It was really warm, warm as toes. Mm -hmm. And the summers would be just hot in Indiana like this. Only with 90 degrees of humidity just the size of Indiana, mm -hmm. the winters would be very cold, very cold. And a lot of times we didn't have tents to sleep in the wintertime. So we had to sleep out in the open on our, on our, in our sleeping bag. Wake up in the morning, snow in your hair and your eyebrows, but you're warm otherwise. You know? Wow. Um, I thought you didn't have tents. Wow. And they, like I said, the people were friendly. Uh, they called they called them Mama Son and Papa Son, were Mom and Dad. Mm -hmm. And our houseboy's name was, was say, what was it? Koshi. Koshi, as our houseboy. Mm -hmm. Their clothes for us, they could do it, but she clean and wash them. Okay. Um, the, uh, one, of, one thing was, one year, or one time, uh, the, the uh, Chinese guy brought their artillery up to the front lines, and there was a cook coming one mile down the road from us, and he was on them a little bit smell range, all mm -hmm. killed 120 men in, in that outfit. Luckily, it didn't go one mile the other way, I wouldn't be here talking to you. Wow. Never had a chance. I remember we hit him. Um, like I said, I got tired of eating rice. We had rice every day. Huh? I ate rice to this day. Oh. <laughs> Every day for 18 months, barf. I don't like it. <laughs> the way my wife would get it, get me to when I got home is she put it with something else so when it was there. But rice, no. I, I don't care where I go, you got rice. I go the other way. I want to eat part of it. I eat it. It's understandable. Um, how did you remain in touch with your family? Were you able to remain in touch? Just write, write letters when we could. Mm -hmm. That was the only way we could get in touch. Well, when, now when I went to, to Japan on an article called Rest and Recuperation, I went there for three days, and I called my wife on the phone. And it was interesting. When the, when the waves went up and down, when the waves went out, I could hear it. When they come back in, I, when, when the waves went out, I couldn't hear it. When they come back in, I could hear a voice. It was just going in and out of the waves. It was really neat, but I could talk to her. But it, the waves, when the waves went out, I'm going to go back, hi, how you doing? <laughs> wow. Um, how long had you been married before you went? About a month. <laughs> wow. Uh, okay. Um, you already talked a little bit about the food. What other, other things did you eat there? Sea, sea rations. Sea rations. Mm -hmm. And but powdered milk, powdered eggs, and powdered potatoes when we could get them. When they could get them. They don't like them products today. <laughs> Right, right. Um, aside we had from, another breakfast called 
green beef and ghost, but they called it something else, but I won't tell you in front of you later, or if it's an interview, or it's an SOS, which, which if he's talking about getting around, I don't know what it is, but it was green beef and ghost, got a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Busy train, but over there, we made mostly sea ration and, and rice or whatever they had, like I said, the, the mm -hmm. uh, powdered eggs, milk, potatoes. And the powdered eggs, just, ugh, they were awful. <laughs> but it was something to feel your stomach, because you were hungry, and you didn't have a choice, eat that or go starving. And, we all ate. <laughs> yeah, you need the protein probably. Mm -hmm. um, aside from food, did you have plenty of supplies? Oh yeah, yeah, we were all well supplied. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, my, cat, my boss was Colonel Middleton, and, uh, and then we had Major Vaughn in headquarters, and my, my immediate cat, boss was a cat in Milwaukee, he was from Hershey, Pennsylvania, home of Hershey Candy Bar. He was a real nice guy. He was uh, all about in his 20s, maybe 25. But he had some, uh, some connection some kind. He could get beer from any country in the world. Uh, how he did it, I don't know. So he could do it. He come on in, you I'll have, have a beer together. So we could be pretty good friends, but he was a real nice guy. Good. The nurses or whatever, were busy boy. They were busy girls, I'll tell you. But, you know, the mass units, they really worked. They worked them hard. They, and the doctors, they earned already every bit of money they made. And they were, because they had some really tough time when they bring a wound in. in. They were work twenty, maybe fifteen or eighteen hours at a time, mm -hmm. take care of what they were bringing in. So it was not fun for them. Mm -hmm. um, was your supply tent close to where they would have the hospital for the nurses would be? The hospital was about ten miles from us. Mm -hmm. The supplies were closer, but uh, the hospital was ten miles. Mm -hmm. Back further. Uh -huh, probably back down line. Yeah. Okay. Um, was there anything that you did for good luck, or that you kept for good luck? Just did a lot of praying. That works. That was about it. Um, okay. Um, when you went on R&R &R into Japan, what did you guys do? Mostly. Went to movies. I made a few beers in, in a tavern or something. Or not tavern, but in a, in a hotel where we stayed. And that was about it. And, and took pictures and we walked around the countryside. Also. So we were not too weak, so Mount Fuji, Fujiyama, a big, with the biggest mountains over there. And, and Japan's a uh, career, I mean, shoot, Tokyo's a beautiful city, it really is. It was just like walking downtown in Fort, Fort Wayne around here, what was it? That one was that much Americanized mm -hmm. when we went over in World War II. The people were very friendly. They didn't have any shoes, everybody wore sandals, no shoes. And that was the end of it, so none of the Japanese ever had any foot clubs, they didn't wear shoes. So they wore sandals. From, and then on up to the, to the grave, you know, they saw they wore sandals and they wore shoes. Um, did you do any other traveling in, outside of Japan? No. No? Okay. Um, do you recall any uh, particularly humorous or unusual events that happened? Uh, yeah, we had this Colonel Vaughn, I mean Major Vaughn in our company headquarters. And he had that part of his ear shot off. And he was a really nasty guy sometimes. And he called him an earless SOB. <laughs> and he wasn't around. Sorry about my language, that's the way he'd call it. He was, he was not the friendliest guy in the world. But not even how he got along with him, but some of them didn't like him. You know, Sergeant, well, Sergeant Duffy, he was from, I think, from uh, I think Arizona. He was a real nice guy. But uh, he, the only. The other thing it was, it was it was funny. You had a wood buddy. They had a PX area. And this Jewish fellow, Jewish soldier, one of our American boy, Jewish. He was running the PX, and he called him selling to the cigarettes to the, to the Koreans. He got 20 years and 11 for for that. Mm -hmm. He would not have to cover that was there. But there any, a lot of times uh, there would seem to be humor things happen with with the the GIs and, and the and civilians, but it was nothing really. No, it was just something that was funny because you couldn't understand me. They, you know, I want this and this and that and that. I don't know. <laughs> right. That, that's, that's hard to translate when you don't know how. That's right. <laughs> Only I did one thing is, is so this, this, is, this is a true story. This, we had a, a cook company there, and he, of course, he had a big, pretty place for source stuff for, cook, for cooking in the kitchen. We well, got this box in one time said, Said cup size D or C. And said, what in the world? Could figure out what it was. They opened up here with your lady's bra. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
So there's a wax board and he's got the wrong outfit. Whoop, we don't need these. <laughs> That's the truth. Um, did you pull any pranks on each other? Oh, yeah, once in a while we do things. We made it for entertainment. We played cards or rode home, you know, and sat around the bath breed. When we could get a beer, we'd have one. But uh, well, sometimes in the morning, somebody would have a chew side together. You'd go to <laughs> or short seats, your bed but what they made is that they pull the blanket back and then pull the sheet clear, clear up here and then double over. You go to get in and you couldn't get in. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Um, and then, of course, it's sometimes, well, one time it happened, we got, I got about two cookies from my wife. She had mailed them. We got them. They were crumbs, but everybody ate them crumbs. They were tasting pretty good. But they were just about crumbs from all the shipping, you know, from Fort Wayne, Clearwater, to Korea. When they got them, it was crumbs. We ate them all. Everybody joined us. They ate pretty good crumbs. I said, send us some more crumbs. Next time, she, she packed them in uh, uh, styrofoam and paint newspaper, and they were a lot better. We got, they were all in one piece. We got, but first time, they were crumbs. <laughs> Did you get other kinds of special packages like that? Nothing but mail from home and food, and that's it. And my two, my, my, one of my tent mates ordered, and we did have tent, was a fellow by the name of, his name was Fatty Arbuckle. He was, he, he was too young to ever heard, even heard of it. When I was a kid, kid growing up in an outfit, in a movie called Fatty Arbuckle on the Our Gang Comedy Series. Well, this guy was right, this Fatty Arbuckle. His, he was called, called it fat because he was fat. Well, when, he, when my, my tent, met, tent mate in Korea, he was still fat. And he, but he had a fetish for hats, and he had a duffel bag about that high, that big around, full of hats, and every time cap, Charlie saw him wearing a different cap. <laughs> and he was uh, very wealthy. His, his parents inherited, invested his money. He made, he had guaranteed fifty thousand dollars a year for life, and have to do a thing or nothing. Absolutely, it was just there for him. Wow. And he, uh, we, every Sunday, we'd have to take out quinine pills, so we would get blurry. He said, "Oh, I'm gonna take that pill. I don't need them. I won't get blurry." He did. He got mm -hmm. it. Wow. And me, we'd be laying there with the pen. He said, put, put the blanket on the hoop. He called, always called me Hoop instead of John or Hooper. He said, put the blanket on the hoop. I'm free to it. So I put three or four blankets in. In five minutes, they take them off and burn it up. And that's, and that's the way it, malaria works. Malaria affects you. And also, you have it until the day you die and never leave your body. Mm -hmm. You'll come back and you never know what's going to hit you. Mm -hmm. he, he was pretty miserable with that. It was kind of fun, fun disease he had. The boy said one minute he'd be burning up, next minute he was free to death. Mm -hmm. and that's the way it affected him. Wow. Um, so did you have a good relationship with almost all of the soldiers and officers oh, yeah. that you were with? Mm -hmm. We did. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. In fact, I had some interesting, I did have some funny comments, I forgot about When the British come through there, they loved our cigarettes, they liked our American cigarettes much better than they did their own cigarettes called Packers. They'd have them in a little, little round can about that big and about how long the cigarette would be in the middle, middle can they called Packers, but they said, oh boy, we love our, your cigarettes, American cigarettes, much better than we do our own. Mm -hmm. And then the, uh, the Greeks would turk them over there, which also our allies. And these guys, oh, you got they look, look like trees. They had shoulders like that, and oh, they had great big cattle star mustaches, and just real great, great big guys. Just scared the dick, and they carried this sword called a scimitar. You ever heard of a scimitar? A C I M I T I R, great big sword, turn sword like that. And just uh, moon to right, half moon shape. They used it in the water to take and chop the guys' heads off when they were in the fight. And the Koreans were, the, the Chinese communists, the Koreans, snow Koreans were terrified of them. They were mean. But to us, they were just friends to be. And again, they loved our, our chalk. They loved, and they're also our chalk. They loved our American chalk. Mm -hmm. So we, oh, hey, G.I., you want oh, some chocolate? Got ice cream? We're not ice cream, but chocolate and cigarettes. They loved their cigarettes. They were great. They were really good. But they were big. Everyone I never saw one under six foot. They were, they were big men. They're just friends to be, but like that. Them Chinese government didn't like them to see how they, how they terrified them. Right. But they were a good ally, good allies to have. Um, did you keep any personal diary or journal? No, didn't have time to, no. Holy, one thing I did happen, yeah. Uh, when I was there, I saw Bob Hope. He was entertained by Bob Hope. But I sang my tent one day. This guy walked in and said, what's your name? So my name's Jack Benny. You probably never heard of Jack Benny. He's a comedian from back in the 40s. He was really popular. He was a, uh, Jilly's fellow, but oh, he was a great comedian. But he walked around and said, What's your name, soldier? And he showed up and said, my, my name's Jack Benny. And we had that show that night, but I couldn't go see him. He was just a real great guy. Good. Named Jack Benny. And then, of course, Bob, you've heard of, I'm sure you've heard of Bob Hope. Yes. Okay. Well, you've heard of Bob Hope. <laughs> Everybody's heard of Bob Hope. They haven't. <laughs>
But uh, he entertained us, and so did Jack May. He did a good job. And they always, always had pretty women. So we enjoyed that, watching that. But there weren't any pretty women in the Korea, blame me. Mm -hmm. They were all ugly as sin. <laughs> <laughs> do you recall the day that your service ended? Yeah, I do. I got, I got, re, I got, uh, uh, I don't say, uh, return, I mean, I don't, Oh, well, I can't even think of the name of the term when we used it. We, we arrived in, in the, when I got shipped back from Japan, we came home on a troop ship with, I think it was 2,500 of us on a troop ship. It took us 30 days coming home. And uh, we got to uh, Seattle, oh, no, to San Francisco, and from there had to travel across the country, talk to Indianapolis, to a camp. Let's see, what's the name of the camp down here now? You know, we got, I got a release, a release from the outside, a release from right down there, it's just camp in Indianapolis. And I think we had to watch if, if, it, if so any car went by, you had to slip because it might be an officer and so you had to slip. If you didn't, they'd stop and chew your rear end out. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, and then they give you give your all your, your what little money you had, you had come and give you so much uh, let out pay. And then, uh, you, you know, and that was it. You didn't, I walked out of your uniform, had, didn't have anything else. Didn't have any civilian clothes, you went home in your uniform. So I didn't get any civilian clothes, so I got home. But we were there about all day, though, for processing for being we let out of there. I mean. Okay. But everybody was real nice to us. The only thing that made us feel bad, that nobody there to receive us. We just might come home. Just like a forgotten war. Mm -hmm. Didn't get greeted by anybody until you got your own house. Mm -hmm. But like World War II, the guy came home, they were waiting for him to greet him. We never got that. Mm -hmm. Just like a forgotten war. He just feel bad, but that's the way it was. Got 50,000 good men down there in the, in the Korea in that horrible place. 50,000. Several, several of my friends who was within the Army in the States got killed over there. That was pretty rough to handle. They were good all in the early 20s. Um. Oh, and when they start fighting too, and the, shell, the, the shelling is going on, and they are showing up. It's really noisy. Now, you can't imagine how noisy it is. It's just, you think a train makes a lot of noise comes there. That's nothing compared to what the artillery makes in, in the noise in the, in the Army or in the war. Right. Makes a lot of noise. Right. Um, what did you do in the days and weeks after you were discharged? Home. After I got home. Mm -hmm. Well, just trying to enjoy life and look for a job. <laughs> well, the job I had in my life was gone. The place closed, closed so I had to look for a new job. So I heard about an x-ray school being started, an x-ray technician school being started at Parkview Memorial Hospital in Fort Wayne. So I went over there and joined that, and that's how I got to, got to be an x-ray technician. When I moved down here, I was the chief x-ray tech. And then I got, uh, after I got, uh, I was, wouldn't make any money as an x-ray tech, so I got into pharmaceutical sales. And that's why I served until I retired. I sold it for 30 years. Okay. Um. Did you and your wife have a family? We had two children, a boy and a girl. We lost our boy when he was six. He had a brain tumor. Did you make any close friendships while you were in the service? You did. Mm -hmm. Did you um, remain in those relationships? We did for a while, and we kind of drifted away. We have been close for maybe four or five years, something like that. And most, a lot of them were from uh, southern Indiana. I don't know why. I had one of my guys out there was from California, from Los Angeles. And another guy was from... Uh, Colorado. We come from all over the place, really. Mm -hmm. uh, did you join any veterans organizations? Oh yeah, I belong to American Legion. Mm -hmm. Here in Wabash. Mm -hmm. uh, how long after um, tech X-ray technician school did you move to Wabash? Let's see. About ten years. See, we moved down here in '62. Mm -hmm. um, did you participate in activities with the veterans, with the American Legion? Uh, well, not really. I, I didn't. I never did have got into any uh, march, any parade, or anything. I just go down to the lodge and participate down there. We have on the Veterans Day, they always have a free meal for you down there, and that's one thing. That you can't do go down there and play cards, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, 
Do you think that your military experience influenced your feelings about war and about the military in general? Well, you know, I, I had respect for the military, but it, 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 I, I hated war. It's nothing good about war, nothing fun at all. It's just bad news. You hope that these nights you want to go to sleep and wake up the next morning because you never know. Because I said we had to always have our, what they call a get out bag, bag packed in Korea. So if the current Chinese or Koreans might break through the front line, we'd be ready to go. So we could, they could let us know and get out there in a hurry so we could get back further and maybe get ourselves organized with, with ammunition and ammunition and rifle and all that stuff. So we always had to get out bag packed, mm -hmm. always ready to go. But boards are hell. They are not fun for anybody, not anybody. And I talked to those nurses in hospitals and doctors, oh, horrible. Mm -hmm. Half coming over them, they just blow it off. We were uh, blinded and terrible. And then had a horse, the North Korean had a, a little trick they pulled, which wasn't very nice, but they would, a lot of times there was always two guys to a foxhole. And they'd fall asleep, both of them fall asleep sometimes. The Chinese Communists would come over there and kill one or the other, and then let him wake up in the morning and find his buddy dead, some of which start crazy man right there. And just couldn't take it. Mm -hmm. You know, the mental institution. It was really sad. VA hospitals, really sad. Mm -hmm. they, did, they did that. And then when they, my buddy told me when the Chinese and North Koreans or communists were ready to charge, they, plot, they blow a hot bugle and the boy then all hell break loose. You know, where they come? So you waves and five. And it was not good. So yes, I was glad to be back, back behind the lines because it was really bad. And the poor guy in the front lines, I might really were cold because they don't, always didn't have a chance to get, to get proper clothing, so they were really cold. It was, it was hell. It was. I didn't leave anything over there and go back after. And I have no desire to go back to Korea ever. But Japan, I, that, that's different, but not, not Korea. Not Korea. Um, how did your experience and your service affect your life after the war? Well, it made you appreciate what we have here in the United States because over there, it's a whole, whole, whole new way again, whole new life, whole, whole new beginning. They didn't have anything we have. Not even our poor people in the country, they, they, all the people over there do not have near anything that we have even in a, in a poor people in the country, really. And uh, they were seemed to be happy, even for, but they, they didn't know any better, but that's all the life there was. Well, one other, one other thing about, we, I can still remember seeing them many over in the rice paddies picking rice. And then they have, they use human manure for fertilizer, and you, when they hit, when they haul that haul that manure to the front to the rice paddies from wherever they gathered it, you smell them a mile away, and oh, the stench is awful. Jeez, they work in that stuff. And you can know, see them bent over it, put, put planting that rice and picking it out, and boy, that was that was nice funny. And then you know they're gonna, if your father will hold a honey wagon, that's what you did. You didn't get anything else to look forward to. If he planned rights, that's what you did. And if some of them, they were lucky they had school teachers, you could be a school teacher. But mainly the women were school teachers. But uh, it was not much of a fun place over there. I, like I said, I, I respected the military, but the wars are hell. So I don't care who they are. There's, there's nothing, nothing fun about a war. It, it made me realize how lucky I was, like I said, to be an American and live in this country. They might they run us down this country now. Makes me really bad because a lot of good men died and fought and died over there for, for this country and just like they are doing on now in, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And I have to respect those guys because they got a tough job to do. And they should be have we should have the back of the United States, American people. Mm -hmm. They're fighting for you and I. And freedom is not free if you don't earn, work it, work for it and keep keep at it so you can be free. Mm -hmm. So. Well, you know, they're going to appreciate all the freedom we have here in the United States. And you can go to Russia and try and live like we do or China. It ain't going to happen. They're a whole, they're a whole new life over there. So, this is the greatest country in the world, as far as I'm concerned. Always will be. And I'm proud to be an American. I'm proud to serve my country. Okay. I say it all honesty. All right. Um, is there anything else? Any other stories or anything that you'd like to add? Our uh, introduction to the Army, 
Like I said, when we went in, it was really cold. We never even we 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 back bivouacking out, bivouacking out. And we went out in the field and did our exercise with with the guns and everything. But they sleep out in the cold. Like I said, when it was 20 below zero, and a number of fellows died while we were out there. But uh, it was really cold. I thought it was about as bad as Korea, but pretty cold. 20 below zero was pretty cold. But we were dressed warm enough for that. But over there, that's a whole new ball game. It was really cold, but we survived. But well, some of the officers sometimes cut up, or the nurses too would cut up, they put different hats on in their uniform and actually, but just to relieve the tension because of the, the pressure they were under all the time, hell, those poor, poor guys come in and all shot up. Mm -hmm. I can't think of anything else. We had, oh, we had, uh, we had one thing that was fun and funny, well, not funny, but interesting. We had a cook in our company where we were stationed in Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas, in the anti aircraft school. And he was a tremendous cook. And he, he would bake 800 pies at a sitting, 800. And he was such a good cook that the company commander hired him. And when we left the company, he went with him. <laughs> when we left the service, he went with him as a mm -hmm. cook because he had. So I don't sometimes visit and he went in for cooking. He went with that guy was, oh, talk about it. unbelievable cook like you ever seen a baker, man. He he could really do it. He really knew what he's doing. Mm -hmm. But uh, all our soldiers all our officers were pretty good men really. A lot of a lot of good guys. I had a lot of cut up. Uh, well I think we played like I said, sometimes we like I said, we tied the shoes together early. Somebody come back home from the kid actually was kinda of bombed or pretty well smashed. They put his hand in, in, in a warm bucket of water. When he did that, he'd urinate with his pants. And wake up in the morning with his bills. <laughs> they did that. <laughs> it was just a way to live, leave, relieve tension. But <laughs> they were really, oh, you went not urinate in the morning. Your, your friends, that guy next to him might be saved you or you might be saved him. So you know that you were all good guys. Everybody was friendly to everybody. Some of the officers were tough guys, but you lived with it. In fact, some of the non cop the sergeants and below were rougher on us than the officers were. But it was it was a good experience. And like I said, I've grown to appreciate my freedom and a wonderful thing we have in this country. So, you know, the country world can tell it's just country for anything, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. I love it. I'm proud to serve my country. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. okay.